Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Rizzo. I'm the lead DevOps engineer at Botanics Labs. I want to start with a confession. I love failures. And not just because I enjoy watching systems crash and bore, because each failure teaches us something profound about our system that success could never teach us. And that's just a personal opinion. But think about it. When was the last time we learned something deep or a very deep engineering lesson from something that's working perfectly or a system of yours that is working perfectly? That's right. That's right. It's the failures that shape us. It's the failures that force us to grow, that reveal the hidden weaknesses in our most carefully crafted systems, in our most stable system. It's the failures that teaches us the flaws in our designs. It's not the success stories, but the failures and the fixing, the fixing of the failures. That is what teaches, forces us to grow. I want to thank you for joining me in my talk today on engineering failure resilient systems and proactive strategies for distributed network reliability. I would say I've spent the last couple of years in the trenches building and sometimes breaking distributed systems. But yeah, that's just for the fun of it. Today, we're going to cover why failure is innovatable in distributed systems, common failure patterns, proactive resilience strategies, and building resilient teams and culture. I would say it's a meme for presentation. Just I'll try not to be too technical and just go over the, just go high surface. It's 3 a.m. The systems are down, services are halted. A lot are blowing up. What now? Your boss is on your neck. The whole team is gathering up. The dashboard is all painted red. Services are down. What do you do? My microservices can't connect. No external ask. We've all had that point in time in our career where we've had to wake up to those annoying alerts. It's unavoidable. It's really unavoidable. It's what it's what makes us engineers, essentially. Failure is not the exception. It's the rule. Every time something, everything fails all the time. Where in the as the Amazon sheets you said, in distributed systems, failure isn't just possible; it's inevitable. The question is, since if your systems fail, but when, how, and at what cost? What would be the cost of a system failure? What is in that service level agreement? What is in, what are those indicators? What is the cost for a system failure? What is the cost for that one hour of no access to the systems? What does that cause the system? The key point here is in systems with thousands of components, something is always failing. Something, one system is receiving more traffic than the rest. The, something is always happening here, essentially. I'd ask this question, how many of us here have experienced a failure in production? Okay. You can see all hands are up, essentially. That's just to tell us the output and what it feels like, essentially, having a system failure. We've all experienced that outage in production. We've all experienced that quick fix, that deployment gone wrong, that node running out of running really high on temperature, we've all experienced that. Every hand here represents a lesson learned about resilience. That's, you can, as the Spider-Man meme indicates, we're all pointing fingers and pointing hands, but no, we shouldn't point hands at ourselves. These systems are bound to fail. It's all about engineering this system to be failure resilient and knowing what to do and what next, and the next line of action, essentially. Then we look at the cost of downtime. What is the real cost of downtime? I asked earlier. When Amazon S3 experienced the four hour outage in 2017, it cost companies over the, over 150 million. These failures create ripples around in industries reliant on cloud services. Look, think about the customers, how they felt regarding this four hour, during this four hour outage. This shows how interconnected we are in the, or hyperconnected we are and reliant on certain services 
And this is this asks the question: What is the real cost of downtime? What what is the real cost of downtime in your system in your service? Beyond traditional reliability engineering, which focuses on maximal uptime through redundancy and fault tolerance, these approaches are necessary, but are they sufficient for stage complex distributed environment? We ask ourselves. Due to the limits of uptime metrics, resilience over redundancy, and preparing for the unknown, metrics like uptime and availability are no longer sufficient for just to ensure system reliability. Modern infrastructures must plan to fit was planned for failure proactively. It must de- these systems must be designed and architected for resilience. They must be architected for to plan for failure within them, essentially, because failure is not the exception, it is the rule. Here we talk about the pillars of resilience engineering and the five pillars of resilience engineering as outlined here. The anti-fragile architecture, chaos engineering processes, system breaker design, Second breaker design architecture patterns, dynamic resource allocation, and of course, monitoring and observability because you cannot fix what you do not know. You cannot fix what you, you can't monitor, essentially. So we look at anti- anti-fragility, what anti-fragility looks like. And anti-fra- what is anti-fragility? The question is, unlike resilient systems that res- resist failure, Anti-fragile systems grow stronger through these disruptions. They use adversity to evolve and adapt. This is incorporating chaos inputs, real-time feedback, and diversification to create systems that optimize under stress. The keyword optimize under stress here. And then we look at chaos engineering practices. The case study here would be Netflix's Chaos Monkey 2, which randomly terminates production instances. This wasn't madness, it was survival. Think about this, look at it in this way. Your systems are gonna fail either way. There's always gonna be that increase in traffic or is increase in system load. So why not recreate it yourself? Why not plan for it yourself where you have total visibility on the system, where you have where you know and you can monitor what is going on and how what failure looks like. When you're in charge of the failure, you're orchestrating the failure. Exactly. So that's what Chaos Monkey is about. I advise you look into the Chaos Monkey too because that's learning through deliberate failure. The key point there, deliberate determinates random instances in production, ensure systems can handle failure component, trans- and it just transformed into a, this, an entire discipline of chaos engineering and multiple companies all around the world incorporate this type of care, this type of discipline in their service basically basically because you have to learn through deliberate failure you have to plan for the failure you need to take control of what failure looks like then we look at circuit breaker architecture part, design patterns a circuit breaker is a proactive is a protective and safety mechanism that prevents the application from continuously making requests to a service that has problems or is down this is basically isolation as a strategy. Think about a distributed system where of 10 nodes, where two nodes are down and you have a circuit breaker in, in, in front of the system. When you implement a circuit breaker design pattern, the traffic and traffic would never be directed to the 40 nodes because the circuit breaker is aware that those nodes are 40 and therefore traffic would be directed to the healthy nodes. Circuit breakers prevent cascading failures by failing fast when downstream services degrade essentially. Then we look at dynamic process allocation. Here we encourage or we we come commit to self in system that automatically responds to changing conditions. We look at Kubernetes pod auto scaling as a case study that scales based on custom metrics. We look at predictive scaling systems that analyze historical patterns and scale preemptively. Resource controls that automatically redistribute capacity during degree of performance and intelligent load shedding that prioritize traffic based on business impacts. Then of all monitoring of and observability, like I earlier said, you can't fix what you can't see. Logs, traces, and metrics together form the backbone of modern observability stack that gives engineers actionable insight. Monitoring must always establish baseline behavior and detect anomalies automatically. 
use your monitoring and observability to actually always be able to de distinguish between noise and actionable signals because you do not want your engineers waking up in the middle of the night for noisy signals for un unactionable alerts, basically. That's why you have to build a, a stable and proactive monitoring and observability stack for your service. Now we look at common failure patterns. This is fine. The failure pattern number one, we look at cascading failures. The re look at multiple case study here, which will be provided in the documentation. We look at Slack 2021 global outage. We look at the Netflix Eve, the Netflix Christmas Eve outage in 2012. This yeah. example of retry stuff. We look at failures due to resource contention, the Robin Hood trading outage in 2020. These are examples, these are public examples of what failure or what common failure patterns look like, essentially. Secondly, we look at operational failures. We look at when there is a configuration drift, a deployment problem or human error. Configuration drift, firstly, when there is a, a slight change in configuration, maybe from a, a third party provider or even from a user. We look, the case study here is the sales force database outage in 2019. We look at the de deployment problems. We look at TSB bank migration failure in 2018, which occurred when they tried to migrate their services from one provider to another provider and they ran into deployment issues because this were not planned for this. They were not preemptive. Look at the night capital trading loss in 2012 and the Amazon SD outage in 2017, which a whole lot of services globally were heavily relied upon. We look at failures, due, operational failures due to human error, the GitLab data loss in 2017, where, where, where a GitLab engineer mistakenly deleted a production DB and the outage was due was out for, and the services were out for four hours. These are things we do not want to happen, but they are common failure patterns, failure due to human error. We look at failure pattern number three, which is software failure. Failures due to resource exhaustion, dependency failure. We look at the did, GitHub details. I would encourage you to look at the GitHub details incident in 2018 and the Reddit outage in 2016. These are failures due to resource exhaustion when systems aren't architected or built in resilience or to act to scale for when there is when there is an increase in traffic. This is what happens. Dependency failures when. The, system is updated or there's a system upgrade and there is no accountability on what dependency looks like. Look at that Stripe API. A case study will be the Stripe API outage in 2018 in 2019 and the fastest CDN outage in 2021. What does achieving 99.999 reliability look like? The 5.9 reliability just means five minutes of downtime per year. Is that possible? When bro says downtime, it's can we do that? Is that achievable? What does achieving down? What does this look like? What does achieving five minutes of downtime look like? It looks like eliminating all single points of failure, implementing zero downtime deployment and rollback, designing for partial availability during degradation, redundant infrastructure, resilient network architecture, comprehensive monitoring, and also on the code level, microservice design pattern with resilience patterns essentially that is what achieving five nines means essentially five minutes of downtime in a year it is achievable it is it is possible when we plan for a reliable system that is what we achieve basically so when we look at the resilience engineering toolkits what how we can identify fragility code part code and patterns and monitor and measure for identify fragility, we use architecture as it reviews our failure modeling to locate the independent of failure and fragile dependencies. By fragile dependency, we look at main dependencies that, that are actively updated or actively rolled out. We don't want to design our systems on those kind of dependencies because it, we need to be able to account for those changes, essentially. We look at how we architect our code and the kind of, the kind of software patterns we use in designing our applications because basically that's where the that always is the bottleneck if we don't have accurate foundational patterns or proper uh, foundational pattern then we also need to monitor and measure monitoring and measurement in our resilience code toolkit because 
we need to define our SLIs and SLOs, the indicators and the objectives and the error budget. And we also need to have proactive dashboards and tracing to observe this system held in real time. In conclusion, failure can only be embraced, essentially. That's why we need to embrace the inevitable. Is your system built to break and bounce back stronger? Failure is not a risk, it's a certainty. Building failure resilient distributed system requires bold design and continuous experimentation and cultural resilience. With the right tools and mindsets, we can build systems that don't just survive chaos but thrive in it. Thank you very much. And I will be willing to answer any questions about system resilience. Thank you very much once again.